Yo, what's going on, guys? Turn my up for simple snippets, and welcome back to a new video tutorial under operating systems. And we are going to be taking a look at multi-level queue scheduling algorithm, which is a CPU scheduling algorithm. So, if you've been following this entire CPU scheduling algorithm playlist, we've seen quite a lot of scheduling algorithms. That is, first in, first out, SJF, SRT, priority based, round robin, and so on. And multi-level queue scheduling was left out. So one of our subscriber asked to cover this video, and I had totally forgotten about it. So yes, today we are going to be taking a look at multi-level queue scheduling. And basically, there are two different types of multi-level queue scheduling. So there is multi-level queue scheduling, which is a basic one, and there is a multi-level feedback queue scheduling. So we'll see that in the next video. So there are basically two different types. So today we are going to be taking a look at multi-level queue scheduling algorithm. And as the name suggests, multi-level there are multiple levels, which means that there are multiple categories. So we'll just quickly read through a little bit of theory and then we'll jump to the numerical that is a problem sum which we'll solve. So make sure you watch this video till the end if you want to see the numerical which is being solved. So starting off, multi-level queue scheduling has been created for situations in which processes are easily classified into different groups. Okay, so in real world scenarios, obviously processes are of different types, right? So there are system level processes, there are user level processes, and then there are different interactive processes which are having different types of categories. So a common division is made between foreground and background processes, right? So let's say on the foreground you are running an application, but in the background you are updating some other application, right? So these kind of scenarios happen in real world. So that's why we specify different types of categories to processes. Now these types of processes have different response times, different requirements, and different scheduling needs, right? So they have to be processed in different ways. So in addition, foreground processes may have higher priority or background processes because you don't want your application which is currently running being interrupted because of some background process, right? So this is the whole crux of multi-level queue scheduling. You can read through the entire theory. I'm not going to get into a detailed description. Basically, it's very easy to understand. So let's consider an example of multi-level queue scheduling algorithm with five queues. So in the diagram, you can see that there are five different queues, one, two, three, four, and five. So based on the different type of process, each queue has its own priority. Okay, so each queue has absolute priority over lower priority queues, which means that if a system level process comes and an interactive process comes, the system level process will always get higher priority and will be scheduled and processed first. Okay, similarly, if a batch process is coming, that is a background process is coming in, and then there is an interactive process which is at number two, the interactive process will get higher priority. So this is how multi-level queue scheduling works. So a little bit of theory about multi-level queue scheduling. If you're preparing your theory answer, you can make a note of all these theory points and you can also draw the diagram. But now let's just jump into the numerical because only then you'll understand the entire working properly. So both theory and practical will be covered. Okay, so let me just read out the problem. So consider below table of four processes under multi-level queue scheduling. So we have to use multi-level queue scheduling over here. Now the queue numbers denote the queue of the process. So as you can see, we have a column which is known as queue numbers over here and we have two queues, okay, Q1 and Q2. So this blue one is queue number one and the yellow one is known as Q2. So there are two different queues which means that there are two different types of processes. Now the priority of Q1 is greater than Q2, okay. So basically Q1 is greater than Q2, okay. So that's how the priority is assigned. Q1 uses round robin. Now, since the processing and scheduling requirements of different types of processes are different, the scheduling algorithm being used can also be different in different queues, which means that whatever processes that are allocated to Q1 are going to be using round robin algorithm. So this is going to be round robin and with a quantum of two, you can see it's given in the question and Q2 uses FCFS. So Q2 is going to be using first come first serve. Now I've covered both these scheduling algorithms in previous videos from this playlist. So if you have missed any of these algorithms, you can check out this playlist. So that's one unique thing about multi-level queue scheduling is that we can apply multiple algorithms to multiple queues depending upon the requirements. So we have four different processes. You can see three of them are coming at time zero. So we'll take time in milliseconds. Okay. So P1, P2 and P3 are coming at, at zero milliseconds and P4 is coming at 10th millisecond. We have their burst time, which means that the time required to complete the process. So P1 would require four milliseconds to complete its process by the CPU. That is the CPU is going to take four milliseconds to complete process one. 
CPU is going to take 3 milliseconds to complete process 2 and so on and so forth. Now the things that we have to calculate is completion time, turnaround time and waiting time. And then we have to calculate the average turnaround time that is AVG TAT and AVG waiting time. So that will be for the entire system. Okay, that is the all the completion of all these processes. And we have two different queues as I mentioned, this is queue number one and queue number two. So depending upon what type of process it is, it would be allocated to that queue. And then the GAN chart or the actual process queue will be generated and upon which we will then calculate completion time, turnaround time and waiting time. So this is something that we've been doing in earlier algorithms as well. So you must have seen that. So with that being said, let's start off with the creation of GAN chart. That is the actual process queue. So at time zero, that is at the zeroth millisecond, P1, P2 and P3 are coming. So P1 and P2 are of type one. Okay. So let's consider them as system processes and let's consider P3 as batch process. So P1 and P2 are going to get higher priority and they're going to be allocated to Q number one. So let's put P1 over here and P2 over here. Okay. So we've added them and since I have started writing it from the right because we have inserted things that is we have inserted the processes from this side in the queue and then they would be exiting the queue from this side. Okay. So that's why I'm starting to write them from the right. Similarly at the zeroth millisecond P3 is also coming in, but that would be assigned to queue number two. Right. So let's start to generate the GAN chart. So at zero second, three of them are coming in, but P1 and P2 will have higher priority over P3. So the CPU is going to select processes from Q number one. Okay. And not Q2 because CPU is going to give higher priority to Q number one and it will start executing P1 or P2 because both of them are coming at time zero and both of them are equal priority. So you can select any of the two. I'm going to select P1. So starting off with P1 at zero second. So the scheduling algorithm that Q number one is using is round robin and the quantum Q is going to be two milliseconds. So this is given in the question, right? So for two seconds, P1 is going to be executed. So from zero to two, P1 is being executed, but we know that P1 requires four milliseconds to complete its process, which means that P1 is still left out, right? So now, this P1 is again going to be added over here in the queue because it's still left out and I'm just going to add it over here and I'm just going to write the remaining time which is left over here that is 2. Okay. Now I'm just going to erase this P1 from over here because it is moved to the end of the queue and now the next most process is going to be P2 which is going to be processed. So CPU is going to look at queue number 1 and queue number 2. And again, it is going to see that P2 is already there in the ready queue. So it's not going to process P3 because P2 has higher priority over P3 because P2 is a different process, right? So it's going to start executing P2. So I'm going to write P2 over here. So P2 requires three milliseconds, right? But the quantum of round robin algorithm being used on ready queue one, that is Q1 is two. So again, P2 is going to be executed for two milliseconds. So from two to four, it is executed. And now this P2 is again added to the end of the queue. So I'm going to write P2 over here and I'm going to erase this P2. Okay. Now P2 executed from two to four, which means process two was completed two seconds. However, process two requires three seconds, which means one second is still left. So I'm just going to write that one second over here. Again, CPU is going to look at the two queues, queue number one, that is this one and this one. So it still sees that P1 and P2 are two processes which are still there in the ready queue. So it's going to start off with P1 now because this is where the pointer is now. That is P1 is the next most process in that queue. So again, it's going to take P1 and we know that two seconds or two milliseconds of P1 is left out and the quantum is also two. So from four to six, P1 is again going to be executed. And now P1 is completely processed, right? So I'm just going to write zero over here. So P1 is done and now the only thing left in the ready queue is P2 which is for Q1. Okay. So now again the CPU is going to look at Q number one that is this one and Q number two which is this one. So it sees that there is P3 in Q number two but there is also P2 in Q number one. So since this Q1 that is Q number one has higher priority over Q number two it is going to start executing P2. So for P2, we know only one milliseconds is left. So from six to seven, P2 is going to be executed. 
and then P2 is also done, right? So zero I'll write over here and then P2 is removed from the ready queue because it is completely processed by the CPU. So now at seventh millisecond, the CPU is going to take a look at both the queues and it can see that at seventh millisecond, there is only P3 remaining in the queue number two, right? So CPU says that, okay, since there is nothing there in queue number one, I'll start processing P3 in queue number two. Now we know that for queue number two, we're using FCFS, right? So what happens is CPU takes this process P3 and from seven milliseconds, it starts executing P3 till 10th millisecond. Okay. Now we know that P3 requires eight milliseconds out of which from seven to 10, three milliseconds have passed, which means that only five milliseconds of P3 are still left. But at 10th millisecond, you can see that a new process P4 is being added to queue number one. So we have a new process P4, which is coming in at 10th millisecond and it is added in queue number one. So at that moment, CPU stops processing P3 because P3 is in queue number two, which has lower priority than Q1, right? So as soon as a new process comes in queue number one, the CPU preempts the processing of P3, which means it stops the processing of P3 in between. So that is the reason why P3 executes only from seven to 10 and at 10th second, or 10th millisecond P3 is coming in. So CPU now takes P4, okay? So I hope you're understanding how the algorithm is working. Now, since there is only one process in queue number one, P4 is gonna be executed entirely. So from 10 to 12, it is gonna be P4. Then again, P4 is gonna be taken because the quantum is two, right? So CPU has to switch between the processes in queue. But since there is only one process in that queue number one, it is going to switch on to P4 only. So from 12 to 14, again, it is going to be P4. So from 10 to 12, it is two milliseconds from 12 to 14. It is again, two milliseconds, which means total four milliseconds, but you can see that P4 requires five milliseconds. So one more second, it is going to be executed. So it's going to be P4 again, and this is 15th millisecond. And now this process is done. So now again, CPU is going to come back to P3. So we know P3 was preempted from seven to 10. So it executed for three milliseconds. However, P3 requires eight milliseconds, which means five milliseconds are still left. So now P3 is again executed by the CPU for five more milliseconds. So from 15 to 20, and then P3 is also done. Okay. So this is the entire Gantt chart and the actual process queue and how the CPU executes the, all these processes. So I hope you are clear about this entire process. And now we can actually calculate the completion time, the turnaround time and waiting time for all these individual processes from this Gantt chart. So let's try to calculate that. So the completion time is the time when the actual process completed execution, right? So it's very easy to understand. So let's see for process one. So process one started at zeroth millisecond, right? It started at zeroth millisecond, but it completed its process at sixth millisecond. You can see over here. So I'm going to write six over here. So after six milliseconds, there is no instance of P1, right? In the entire process queue. So that's why we have to write six milliseconds over here. Let's see for P2. You can see the last instance of P2 over here at seventh millisecond. So I'm going to write seven. For P3, P3 ended at 20th millisecond. So just writing 20 over here. For P4, it ended at 15th millisecond. So I'm going to write 15 over here. Now let's calculate the turnaround time. Now the turnaround time is given by the formula of arrival time minus completion time. So turnaround time for P1 is going to be six. That is completion time minus arrival time, which is zero. So it's going to be six over here for P2 is going to be seven for P3. Again, it is going to be 20 because all of their arrival times are zero for the last one. That is P4. The turnaround time is going to be 15 minus 10 because P4 came in at 10th millisecond. So it's going to be five. So average turnaround time is going to be six plus seven plus 20 plus five divided by the number of processes that is four, which is going to be 9.5 milliseconds. So let's calculate the waiting time now. So from the formula, you can see the waiting time is given as turnaround time minus burst time. So this is the turnaround time for process one minus the burst time, which is four. So waiting time is two turnaround time is seven burst time is three. So seven minus three is going to be four. Here is going to be 12 that is 20 minus eight for the last one. It is going to be five minus five, which is zero. So the average waiting time is going to be total of these divided by four. So again, two plus four plus 12 divided by four. So this is plus zero. 
and divide by 4 which is going to be 18 by 4 which is ultimately going to be 4.5 milliseconds. So yeah, this was the entire numerical on multi-level queue scheduling and I hope you have a very good understanding about both the theory as well as the practical numerical aspect of multi-level queue scheduling. So that's it for this video guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends and if you haven't yet subscribed on this channel, make sure you subscribe so that you get notified whenever I upload a new technology oriented video on this channel and for that you can also turn on the notifications. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you guys in the next video tutorial. Peace.